Hello everyone. In today's class on advanced characterization techniques, we are going to study a few things about properties of neutron radiation and neutron sources. Up till now in this course or rather this module of the course, we have been dealing with mostly X-ray diffraction and electron diffraction. But now we are going to look at a different class of radiation that is neutron diffraction. So all of us are aware what exactly are neutrons. So we know that neutrons are essentially subatomic particles which are there sitting in the nucleus along with the protons. These particles are characterized with no charge and have mass which is equal to 1.675 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg. We are also aware that this mass of neutron is slightly higher than that of protons. Now in addition to the mass neutrons are also characterized with a spin of half and nuclear magnetic uh, dipole moment of 1.913 times that of a nuclear magneton which is approximately equal to about 5.05 .05 into 10 power minus 27 joule per tesla. So having said that we know that neutron as such is a very different subatomic particle when compared to proton and an electron. Now with the exception of hydrogen 1, all atoms consist of neutrons and protons. In fact, the neutrons bind the protons together in the nucleus because the protons with all their positive charges have a tendency of repelling each other. The nu neutrons actually act as glue that holds all the protons together in the nucleus. Having said that, we are also aware that if in the same uh, for the same atom we can have a situation wherein the number of neutrons are different in the nucleus and such kind of atoms are actually known as isotopes. One of the classical example of an isotope is the carbon 12 and carbon 14 isotope wherein we know that the carbon 12 isotope is actually characterized by 6 protons and 6 neutrons while the carbon 14 isotope that we are having has 6 protons but in this case we have 8 neutrons okay. So moving uh, ahead we also know that the bound neutrons in the nucleus are absolutely stable however the unbound neutrons which are just not associated with the nucleus are highly unstable. Well what exactly I mean when I say that they are unstable well the neutrons undergo what is known as beta decay. What happens in a beta decay is that a neutron gets transformed into a proton, a electron and a electron antineutrino. Let us not get into nuclear physics but for the time being and assume or rather understand that it is not possible to have unbound neutrons okay, as a source uh, for carrying out neutron uh, diffraction or neutron scattering experiments. Therefore. Uh, another important point that needs to be noted that all this uh, dissociation or decay mechanism that I told ensures that the lifetime of the neutrons is only about 15 minutes and therefore it is necessary to produce neutrons as and when required. Coming back how to produce neutrons well we can always produce them using nuclear fission as well as nuclear fusion. I am not going to talk much about fission and fusion but let us talk about neutrons as a particle. We know that neutrons are subatomic particles and quantum mechanically they show wave particle uh, behavior. So for a neutron traveling at a particular velocity we can always assign a particular wavelength and treat it as a wave with that particular wavelength according to the de Broglie wavelength criteria. Now the beauty about neutron, uh, neutrons as a source for carrying out diffraction or scattering is essentially that the velocity at which the neutrons travel when combined with their mass essentially ensures that the kind of wavelength that we are going to get is of the order of angstroms which falls in the range of that of X-rays and this is what ensures that we can use neutrons for carrying out diffraction experiments where also the inter uh, atomic uh, or rather interplanar distances are of the order of few angstroms. But when compared to X-rays 
neutrons offer much better penetration depth and that is essentially because neutrons essentially interact with the nucleus of the atom. Now if you look and consider an atom the nucleus occupies a much smaller uh, region compared to the entire at size of the atom because most of the region is occupied by the electron cloud. Having said that the, uh, this ensures that the neutrons have a much better penetration depth compared to x-rays and it can be as high as a few millimeter in materials with high density. As I had already mentioned this is essentially uh, due to the fact that neutrons see or rather feel only the nucleus and not the electron cloud. So they travel essentially through a very open structure compared to x-rays or electron that see or rather interact with the electron cloud. The same philosophy or the same concept is shown over here in this figure. So if you look at a free surface over here and consist uh, co and consider it comprises of uh, all these atoms uh, with the dark spot at the center being the, nu uh, the nucleus and the electron cloud surrounding it. You see that the neutrons actually interact with the nucleus right and it can undergo diffraction or scattering while the x-rays interact with the outer electrons and it undergoes x-ray scattering or diffraction. Therefore, we can assume that the probability of x-rays interacting with an atom is much higher than that of a neutron and therefore, the penetration depth of neutrons is much higher than that of x-rays. Having said that, neutrons also have a tendency to interact with the dipole. Mind you, we had talked that you know neutrons have a particular spin and a magnetic dipole moment associated with it and therefore the neutrons can interact with free electrons that also have a dipole moment and this dipole dipole interaction can give us information about magnetic scattering or diffraction. I will like to bring to your notice that neutron diffraction is probably one of the most sophisticated uh, technique that can give us some information about the magnetic structure of the material. Having said that, let us try to understand how exactly diffraction takes place when neutrons are used as a source. Well, the concept is exactly similar to that of x-rays. Only thing is instead of uh, x-rays getting bounced off from the outer part of the atom, we have neutrons which get bounced off or rather reflected from the nucleus of the atom. Therefore, we get a interference pattern very similar to that of x-rays or electrons. The diffraction theory for x-rays and electrons can be easily extended to that of neutrons and therefore the scattering and diffraction principles that we employ for x-rays and electrons can be borrowed one to one for neutrons also. This actually ensures that Bragg's law is valid, uh, is valid for neutron diffraction and that we can uh, carry out all the x-ray diffraction and scattering techniques that we talked about using neutrons. However, as I had already mentioned one of the best part uh, or rather the best uh, uh, kind of property of neutrons that uh, is on offer which is not there for electrons and x-rays is that they can give us information about the magnetic structure. Now this information is not given either by x-rays or electrons, but neutrons can offer us information regarding the magnetic structure of the material under consideration in addition to the, uh, the crystal structure. Okay. So now when it comes to generation of neutrons, so we had talked how we generate x-rays right different ways of generating x-rays similarly neutrons also can be generated in different ways essentially we have to draw off the neutrons from the nucleus of the atom and this can be done using a fission reactor in a fission reactor we use a neutron source like radioisotope californium 252 now this releases neutrons which are bombarded on a u235 nuclei this leads to fission of the uranium nuclei and release of neutrons. 
Now, with the use of proper moderator, we can control the number of neutrons that are released and this can act as a continuous source of neutrons, right. Another important way of producing neutrons is using what is known as a spallation source, in which case we use synchrotron to accelerate protons to very high energy of the order of giga electron volt range and focus this uh, beam on depleted uranium, uranium target or these days the most favored, uh, favored target is tantalum, which ensures that neutrons actually fall off or rather fall off from this material that is from uranium target or tantalum target giving a pulsed uh, source of neutrons. I would like to mention that a fission reactor can be used for producing nuclear fuel and therefore in most countries it is generally not used for academic activities. However, a uh, spallation source is more uh, appropriate and is and most of the time is used regularly. However, one of the biggest problem with spallation source is that it produces a lot of radioactive waste that mean that comes from the target material. So, once the accelerated protons hit the uranium or tantalum target and gives out uh, neutrons, the leftover material is highly radioactive. So, this is one of the uh, drawbacks of the spallation source. But having said that, depending on the kind of energy that we have, we can have neutrons into different, uh, ne neutrons can be classified into different regimes. So, if you look at hot neutrons, hot neutrons are moderated at 2000 degree centigrade. They have energy range of about 0.1 to 0.5 electron volt, wavelength of about 0.3 to 1 angstrom and travel at a velocity of 10,000 meter per second. There are thermal neutrons which are moderated at about 40 degree centigrade. They have energy range of the order of 0.01 uh, to 0.1 electron volt, wavelength of the order of 1 to 4 angstrom and travel at a velocity of 2000 meter per second. Mind you, I hope you have noticed that the thermal neutrons probably are the most important neutrons because look at the wavelength. Their wavelength is of the order of X-rays that we use in a laboratory. Having said that, look at the energy level that we are having. The energy level is of the order of one tenth to one hundredth of an electron volt. That is in the range of a few milli electron volt. In order to produce the same wavelength, if you remember, we are using a voltage of the order of kilo electron volt when it came to X-rays. So, I hope this point is very well taken that we can get the same wavelength uh, of neutrons at a much lower energy level. Now, there are also what are known as cold neutrons. So, these cold neutrons are actually moderated at 2000 degree centigrade and they have energy which is lower than 0 0.01 electron volt and a wavelength of the order of 0 to 40 angstrom and travel at a speed of 200 meter per second. So, most of the cases that we will talk mostly fo will focus since we are keeping X-rays and electrons as our focus, I will talk mostly about thermal neutrons which form in the same range as that of our X-rays. So, from all these sources, how, what is the kind of spectrum, right? Like what is the kind of neutrons that we get? Do we get neutrons of same frequency and energy or a different energy? Well, like X-rays also, we get, you know, we have a continuous spectrum and we have a characteristic peak not here for neutron. In case of neutrons, if you look at the intensity versus wavelength plot, we see that the neutrons follow a Maxwell distribution which has been depicted over here. Most of the times, we do not need a wide range of energy distribution and therefore, we use monochromators to you know, choose only a wavelength of our interest and use it for further uh, use. Now, one of the most important part like uh, which we had talked about during X-ray uh, as well as electron diffraction is actually the scattering cross section. The scattering cross section essentially defines the probability of scattering event between neutrons and nucleus. For a plane wave I k z, a scattered wave which is f of theta and phi 
and is multiplied with e raised to the power i k r by r. Now, this gives us the scattering probability, right. If you remember, this is exactly similar to what we had for x rays, and this term f of theta phi is nothing but equivalent to the structure factor that we had used in case of x rays. So, the differential cross section if you are about to calculate is d sigma by d omega which is nothing but proportional to square of the structure factor. Now, this is nothing but you know the intensity that we get you remember in x rays we had also talked about this is just a change in terminology, but in case of case of x rays we had this intensity proportional to the f square. Now, if you go for integral cross section which is nothing but you know you integrate this differential cross section. So, which is sigma is equal to integral d sigma d omega by d omega this d omega is the solid angle we will talk about it at a in a later slide, but this essentially gives us a measure of effective surface area seen by impinging particles. So, the affected uh, area presented by nucleus to an incident neutron is actually represented in terms of a barn which is nothing but a unit of area and one bar is equal to 10 into minus 27 meter square. Having said that another important point that needs to be noted is that once the neutrons are traveling and they interact with matter they are going to get attenuated that means their velocity is going to change and therefore, the attenuation is given as exponential minus n sigma t where n is the number of atoms per unit volume and t is the thickness. So, the cross sectional is proportional to the square of structure factor. Now, this is very important in determining the intensity of the diffracted beam. Coming back again the reason we are talking so much about uh, neutron cross section is actually because of the wave nature and particle nature. Right. So, here you know neutrons can also be considered as particle nature while in case of x rays we just uh, ensured that you know intensity is proportional to the structure the, the square of the structure factor. Having said that this will be more clear with this uh, drawing over here wherein you see we have incident neutrons which are coming over here and this is uh, the target we see that how the neutrons get diffracted in a particular direction. So, if at all we have uh, a neutron flux of phi which is nothing but the neutron the number of neutron per unit area per time and the sigma is the total number of neutrons scattered per second per for a incident flux of phi. So, our d sigma by d omega where d omega is the solid angle that is covering is actually the number of neutrons scattered per second into d omega right and this is for phi d phi is not it and therefore, our d sigma by d phi is nothing but the number of uh, neutrons scattered per second into d omega in a energy range of about d e right. So, we see that we have incident and what is the probability of neutrons getting diffracted. So, this is nothing but the fraction of neutrons that are getting diffracted in a particular direction omega. So, this is nothing but your neutron cross section and this is absolutely proportional or rather directly proportional to the square of the structure factor. So, let us talk as I had already mentioned that you know the neutrons actually interact with the nucleus of the atom and not with the electron crowd. So, if you look at the nucleus you know that there is a nuclear force associated with the nucleus. Now, the range of the nuclear force is very small and of the order of few femtometers. We are also aware that the kind of wavelength that we are using for neutrons is of the order of few angstroms. Therefore, we have a situation where the wavelength of the neutrons is much much larger than the range of the nuclear force. Therefore, the energy of the neutron is much much lower than the energy of the nucleus and this ensures that there is no energy transfer between neutron and nucleus. This actually ensures that once you have a neutron interacting with a nucleus it does not lose its energy and therefore, all the scattering and diffraction phenomena that are occurring are essentially elastic. 
the wavelength as I had already mentioned is actually decided by the velocity because lambda is equal to h divided by the momentum which is nothing but mv. So, the velocity of the neutrons does not change. However, their angle the d omega part right in the last slide we had talked about may change. So, the scattering is far from nuclear resonance and there is no absorption of neutrons in uh, during interaction of a neutron with the nucleus of an atom. A schematic diagram of the same is shown over here where we have this incident beam of planar neutron beam right and here we see that uh, the number of neutrons per area ds per second after scattering is v ds uh, phi scattering square. This is again your wave uh, square uh, uh, the wave uh, equation which is squared that gives you the intensity ds is uh, the area and v is the velocity. So, at the end of the day we end up getting equal to v a square d omega where d omega is the angle it is not been shown over here, but see it is a solid angle right and a you know that the scattered circular wave has the equation of minus a by r e raised to the power i k r right. So, now the number of incident neutrons per unit area d s which is your phi right is nothing but v xi incident square which is nothing but equal to v and the cross section d sigma by d omega is equal to a square right. So, depending on the scattered circular wave amplitude okay, we are going to get the d sigma by d omega and as you can see the total scattered neutron is nothing but in a solid angle right once you integrate you get 4 pi a square right this is where this term is very similar to that of the surface area of the sphere. Okay, so, we are considering all spherical waves. So, the point is I would like to repeat again that the neutron cross section is actually proportional to the square of the amplitude right like this is what we got even for x rays. Only thing is we are trying to derive it in a slightly different way because here we are going instead of having a wave approximation we are trying to explain the same thing using a particle approximation. Having said that at the end of the day we end up getting the same uh, solution right. So, as in x rays or for that matter in electrons right like in electrons we talked about coherent scattering and in coherent, coherent scattering. So, the actual uh, scattering length right for neutrons with the nucleus is actually given say by a i which is nothing but a plus delta a i. Now, this the delta a i essentially indicates a random component right. So, the random component of scattering vector contributes to incoherent scattering. So, the contribution of a this summation of a or other bracket of a actually corresponds to elastic while this delta a i corresponds to inelastic scattering. Now, the information about collective motion and relative position of the nuclei is given by coherent scattering. So, this is very similar to what we are having right like where your atoms are sitting that means, where your nuclei are sitting and where your neutrons are getting interacted uh, are interacting with this with the nucleus and getting scattered. So, this is because of coherent scattering. However, we also know we have seen this Debye Waller like term that you know at uh, only at 0 Kelvin all the atoms are sitting at their own uh, place in the unit cell. In fact, at any temperature other than 0 they are actually vibrating right. So, we actually get a motion of individual nucleus and that actually leads to incoherent scattering. Now, this contributes actually to this delta a i term. Now, this term is slightly different uh, than uh, the Debye Waller term because that is taken care of, but any small perturbation in the nucleus is actually captured using incoherent scattering. Uh, to just give you an example, I will mention that we you have cross sections associated with both coherent as well as incoherent scattering. Having said that a classical example is that of a hydrogen which has a very low coherent scattering cross section and therefore, cannot be detected using normal neutron uh, you know coherent uh, scattering neutron experiments. However, it has very nice uh, or rather very high incoherent uh, scattering cross section. Therefore, if you want to study diffraction experiments mostly hydrogen is replaced with deuterium which has a very good or uh, rather a very high uh, elastic or rather coherent uh, scattering cross section, but has very poor 
incoherent scattering uh, cross section. So, this way you can see that we can use different kind of scattering events namely coherent and incoherent to detect the presence of a particular element or rather more to, to be more precise a particular isotope in neutron uh, in neutron uh, scattering or diffraction. Mind you if you want to study diffraction where we need to uh, carry out which uh, corresponds to coherent scattering we have to use material or like we will get better signal for deuterium. Therefore, people who work on ice most of which is H 2 O solid H uh, 2 O actually replace hydrogen with deuterium to carry out neutron diffraction studies to determine the crystallographic texture. While if some if you, you are more interested in studying the spectroscopic aspect of it we can always use hydrogen. Having said that another important aspect with neutron diffraction if you remember uh, for x-ray diffraction which x-ray diffraction does not have to offer is the scattering cross section right. So, if you remember we had the scattering cross section or rather the intensity was proportional to f square in case of x-rays and f was nothing but it was your atomic number. So, it is not possible to differentiate between two elements which are very close to each other in the periodic table. However, look what happens when we look at a neutron cross section which is given over here in terms of scattering length. We see that two atoms or like two elements which are very close to each other have very different right. You see aluminum and chlorine we, they have quite a different scattering cross section. This essentially ensures that we can easily separate out these two elements which are very close in periodic table using neutron diffraction. At the same time we also see that we get information about the magnetic cross section also. So, you see here we have nickel 62 here and we have another nickel. So, the scattering cross section for nickel and the magnetic uh, cross section ok they are two different. So, we can actually find out where our nickel atom is sitting and where the magnetic moment is sitting right ditto for cobalt and you see here for different isotopes of nickel you see the huge amount of difference in the scattering cross section. Now, this information is offered only and only by neutron diffraction. The similar information is presented in a very nice way over here. So, we can see here the x-ray relative scattering length we see hydrogen is small carbon bigger as it moves as a function of z. However, when we look at neutron we see that there is no one to one correspondence between z that is atomic number and the scattering length ok and see we can easily separate out between adjoining elements. Taking forward our comparison between neutrons and x-rays we have seen that neutrons actually behave like particle and wave while x-rays are actually electromagnetic wave. Now, neutrons have a mass associated with it while x-rays have no mass associated with them. Neutrons have a spin of half while x-rays have a spin of 1. Oh, uh, they have a magnetic dipole moment while x-rays have no magnetic dipole moment. The neutrons actually interact with the nucleus while the x-rays interact with the electron cloud. Now, neutrons are scattering power independent of 2 theta which has been shown over here. So, you see what happens the intensity versus sin theta well it is almost a straight line well it is always a straight line because it is not dependent on the angle while when we talk about x-rays we know that this value decreases. Remember we had seen this f versus sin theta value how it was decreasing it started from z and it was reducing continuously as a function of theta not so for neutrons. Now, neutrons with their uh, kind of energy they have and they, since they interact only with the neutrons have very low absorption while x-rays get absorbed a lot, uh, but there is a problem since neutron the interaction is weak we need large amount of sample while with x-rays we can live with small amount of sample. Now, in neutrons the neighbors as well as isotopes can be easily discriminated right while for x-rays the neighbors isotopes there is no way we can see isotopes neighbors the discrimination is very very difficult. The detection of light element is very difficult in x-rays while it can be done on a routine basis in neutrons. 
one of the biggest USPs of neutrons is that it can be used to determine the magnetic structure while no magnetic structure information is obtained from X-ray diffraction. As we had already seen that the neutron is a very weak source or rather a very weak probe. But this is not a disadvantage because a weaker probe ensures that the kind of interaction that we are seeing is not because of an artifact or any uh, change in uh, uh, the state of the matter that we are studying. I would like to mention that e the X-rays are intense source and by the when I say intense I am not really talking about synchrotron but even a normal X-ray laboratory source is almost 1000 times brighter than a neutron source. Having said that you should always remember that neutron source are not available uh, every at every place and in fact they are very, they, there are hardly a few places in the world. While X-ray uh, sources and X-ray diffractometers are available uh, at uh, every university and therefore can be used on a day to day basis. Just to show you the, but having said that you know it is not like X-rays are good and neutrons are bad. In fact, these two techniques are completely complementary to each other and this particular slide compl uh, kind of encompasses the basic uh, you know complementary nature of both the techniques. So look at different elements, we have shown, shown different elements over here and see how the neutron cross section and the X-ray cross section varies. So you see that materials with high X-ray cross uh, section have low neutron cross section, right. Therefore you can see that if there is a situation where we have material with high X-ray cross section and high neutron cross section at the same time. We can always use X-ray and neutron uh, diffraction or scattering technique to complement the uh, com uh, to complement and get complete information from the sample under investigation. Now, just to compile, what are the advantages of neutrons over X-rays? Well, both of them have comparable wavelength in the Angstrom level. However, the energy of neutrons is much lower. The neutron lower energy as I had already mentioned ensures that there is no harm to the sample, there is no damage to the sample. The interaction of neutrons with the sample is more of that of a what happens in a ping pong ball right like which gets thrashed from one place to the other while the in case of X-rays the X-ray photon is like a cannonball which is going through the structure right. Neutron diffraction therefore can predict where atoms are that is the nuclei are and what they do. This is something that X-rays cannot tell, X-rays just tell us where the atoms are right, but they do not tell where the nuclei are and therefore atomic structure and dynamics can be estimated directly mind you only using neutrons. The dynamics part come because neutron diffraction not only tells us where the atoms or rather the nuclei are but also what they are doing fine. So this is one of the biggest advantage of neutron diffraction. You know that neutron scattering cross section varies randomly right like we had seen those curves that you know it is not dependent on Z. Now this ensures that we can easily differentiate close elements in the periodic table. At the same time we also have this ability to differentiate between isotopes right the different isotopes of the same element using neutrons. X-rays have no capability to differentiate between the isotopes. As we had seen neutrons offer a very weak probe and therefore it gives us a very better signal. Though the signal is very weak and it takes some time to collect and amplify the signal the weak probe actually ensures that no damage is caused to the material under investigation. More importantly no damage is caused to the structure of the material under consideration. We have seen that neutrons have higher penetration depth and they are very very useful for getting bulk properties. Many a times if our grain size is very large right if the grain size is very large X-rays cannot penetrate and they cannot give us complete information about the kind of phases and say for that matter preferred orientation that is present in a material. This is where neutron diffraction becomes very very important 
and this is something that can be done only with neutron diffraction. So whenever it comes to getting statistically relevant data for a normal neutron uh, for a normal uh, you know diffraction data we can always use neutron diffraction. The biggest uh, advantage and which I am reiterating again and again for neutrons is that they give information about the magnetic structure. Neutrons are essentially neutral particles with spin of half and have a magnetic dipole that interacts with the magnetic dipole of outermost electrons in an atom. This ensures that we can determine not only the crystallographic as well as but also the magnetic crystal structure of the material under investigation. Now this is one of the best advantage of neutron compared to that of X-rays. Now talking about instrumentation, now this is some slide that we had already seen. We saw that, that this was for X-rays, so we had you know a source, a incident beam optics, a sample, a diffracted beam optics and a detector. We have something similar, not exactly the same but something very similar for neutrons. We will try to see how actually we have instruments for carrying out neutron diffraction. So let us start with the source. So as we had seen earlier, like we have a reactor as a source for neutron diffraction uh, for producing neutrons. The reactor is a continuous source and which is shown over here. So you see intensity, you see there is a constant intensity, right? Peak intensity is limited by cooling capability in nuclear reactors. You see the intensity is quite low. However, if you have a spallation source which we had talked about earlier, it is a pulse source. We see here instead of having a continuous uh, energy level, we do get pulses right this is as a function of time and here the intensity of the pulses is much higher because of better cooling control okay but having said that we know that we do not get a continuous spectrum but the intensity is nevertheless higher now for the continuous spectrum right this is very similar to what we have for x rays and once we put a monochromator, we can use a normal diffractometer for continuous source and do the same kind of study that we did for X-ray diffraction. However, if you are using a pulse source, mind you, we have to use a time of flight measurement, wherein we measure the time taken by the neutrons to travel the same distance. Mind you, once the neutrons get scattered they, uh, at different angles after interacting with the material, they are going to take different time to reach the detector and this can be used to measure the diffraction uh, rather the scattering angle and intensity using time of flight measurement right in, in time of flight we know that the velocity or rather the mass of the neutrons is the same their velocity is also the same but depending on the angle of scattering they are going to take different times to reach the detector. So this technique is actually known as time of flight uh, technique. This technique is very fast and however we need very high flux for it. Now this diffractometer data acquisition and analysis is very simple and very well suited for magnetic studies and gives us a very good resolution at low angles. However at high angles we do not have any other choice but to go for time of flight measurements. So just to talk about you know we talked about the optics. So let us talk about the optics. We have seen the source. Now we have what are known as neutron guides. Now what the neutrons guide do? Essentially they reduce the beam delivery uh, losses and ensure that the electron uh, the, the neutrons are traveling in a particular direction. Right. Uh, then we also have what are known as neutron choppers. Now these neutron choppers actually are rotating mechanical disks with openings that actually control the initial velocity of the neutrons. Remember that we have to this initial velocity of the neutrons when I say actually ensures that you are getting neutrons in a particular energy range that is what we are aiming at right. So this is what we want then all this neutron that is incident that interacts with the sample and then we have a detector which requires the time required for a neutron of a particular energy to reach the detector right the scattering angle is related to position of the neutron detector. Now talking in details we know that in X-ray optics also to get a wavelength of a very uh, radiation of particular wavelength we used 
what are known as monochromators. For neutrons also we use mosaic monochromators which are nothing but asymmetrically cut single crystals. This ensures that neutrons with only a particular wavelength are able to pass through. Okay. Similarly, the neutron guides actually reflect the neutrons, right? They reflect the neutrons and thereby uh, kind of um, reduces the path that is available for the neutrons to travel. These comprises of glass plates with about 150 nanometer of nickel coating. So, uh, the neutrons which are incident get reflected and are guided to a particular region. The chopper as I had mentioned comprises of rotating mechanical devices that block neutrons of various energy and allow only neutrons with very low bandwidth to pass right. So, we had seen that there is a Maxwell distribution of the Ma Maxwell distribution we allow only a small part to pass using chopper. There are certain investigations wherein we need polarized neutrons right for doing magnetic study. So, in that case we use a flipper. Now, how does a flipper work? I will show you in the next slide, but keep in mind uh, which is shown over here. So, you see here we have neutrons which are having both kinds of spin right plus half and minus half. Now, we have a substrate which is essentially silicon and a magnetic film coating on it right. So, you can have iron or niobium and we see that all the neutrons which are incident on it get polarized right. So, only one direction. So, you will have neutrons coming in two opposite directions all of them going in one particular direction. Now, this single layer can be replaced with multi layer and we can get multi layer mirrors or super mirrors to get highly polarized neutron source. These are actually very important for carrying out magnetic uh, structure uh, determination. Having said that another most important part of uh, neutron diffraction is actually the detector. Most often uh, the most common detector is the helium ion detector which comprises of uh, a gas filled detector. We also use semiconductor detectors as well as scintillator detectors for, uh, uh, for analyzing neutrons. I have shown a few sch a schematic of the cold neutron chopper spectrometer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory to just give you a feel for things. And here you can see that we have a Fermi chopper. Uh, Let us not talk about it, but it is like uh, more of a chopper that you know uh, controls the kind of uh, wavelengths uh, which are going in. We have a bandwidth chopper, then we have shielding, this is your nuclear guide and here you see here is where our sample is and these are all your detectors right. So, these are pretty big and you see this the entire source to sample right. So, if this is your source over here to sample this distance is huge right 36.2 meter right and everything all of this is shielded right and all this you can see that why very high angles we can get information using the spallation source right. Having talked so much about neutrons let us now sum up with why at all neutrons are important and for this we have to go to the energy momentum space diagram and here we see that this is our energy and momentum uh, uh, diagram or reciprocal space and uh, uh, angular uh, velocity uh, diagram right and here we see that for different amount of you know q and our energy this is I mean you can also plot it as your r versus t right r is the you know uh, spatial uh, distance and t is the time we see that neutron scattering you see there are various other techniques we see Raman scattering over here right it is giving us some information about the time and uh, the time related stuff and the distance related stuff about what is happening at a uh, atomic level. So, you see Raman scattering gives us a very small information which is even better than what we get in using NMR or certain other techniques uh, like uh, dielectric uh, spectroscopy or infrared uh, spectroscopy that is shown over here. But look at neutrons you see neutrons gives us a lot of information see inelastic neutron scattering right because of uh, back scattering right gives us a lot of information. Similarly, here we have small angle neutron scattering and ultra small angle neutron scattering. So, we see when we compare at the q omega right the q omega plot for different materials for the structure of uh, different materials we see that neutron uh, neutrons offer the ability to probe and cover the maximum region in the q omega space and therefore, neutrons are very important source for carrying out material characterization. I hope you appreciate the importance of neutrons in materials characterization. In the next class which is also the last class of this module we will talk about small angle neutron scattering and wind it up. Thank you.